Once a month, we get together with uh, Twin Falls County Prosecutor Grant Loeb's on the show. Uh, 906, it's 53. want to thank you for joining us. Uh, News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And uh, the county's top prosecutor is a busy, busy man as usual. And we'd like to thank him for taking some time out of his schedule. Uh, I don't get to read your name much in the uh, in the newspapers, but I got to read it last week. And uh, this was after there was an effort to get a petition together uh, by some people for a ballot measure next spring, uh, really a referendum on the refugee resettlement program. Uh, your role is constitutionally in the state of Idaho that you review these things, and then you know you make a judgment on whether they'll fly or not. I think in the vernacular, uh, and and you rejected it because you said you thought there were some constitutional issues here that wouldn't pass muster. Now, my interpretation of that was when I was, I, it wasn't as if I had your entire decision in front of me, but was that a lot of these programs had been agreed to or put in place by people who we elected. So therefore we've given them the plenary power, right? And and so they have that and that this would usurp that. Am I right in, in saying that that was what your decision was about? Uh, sort of. Uh, let me uh, go back just a little bit. I, I don't have uh, you're, you're right that the law requires that the prosecutor uh, review for constitutional and legal issues any petition that is circulating uh, that might go on the ballot as an initiative. Uh, and the we don't have the right to say yes or no on it. Um, I can't veto it. I can't say this is unconstitutional, so you can't go forward with it. Um, what we're required to do is to issue a review letter Uh, to the people who have written the initiative language saying if we find any parts of it uh, to be unconstitutional, illegal, or problematic. Uh, The the people that are running the petition then uh, can either accept those changes um, and modify their petition or they can reject them and just go with whatever they choose to go with. Um, And there isn't any uh, provision that allows uh, a single elected prosecutor to, you know, veto the public's right to seek, uh, you know, ordinances through initiative process. So, um, so it's not quite as, you know, uh, strict as you made it sound. Uh, I don't really get to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down on it. Um, the review letter, which we issued, uh, from my office, uh, found a lot of problems with this, uh, proposed initiative. Uh, but, um, those problems can be either addressed or or ignored uh, by the people that are circulating the initiative. And um, mine is not the final word on that either. I, I give you know an analysis based on research and based on experience, but obviously um, I don't I'm not a court, so I don't get to decide ultimately whether this is constitutional or not. That would be something that if the initiative passes and if somebody tries to enforce it, um, I'm sure the people that it's enforced against would say, wait a minute, this is unconstitutional and illegal, and there are five or six complaints we have, and then it would go to a court which would decide that. Now, when 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 you made the, the, the ruling, um, and that might not be the right word either, but when you reviewed it, mm-hmm. and and you essentially said, though, someone could rewrite it and it might be acceptable if, if it no, was I, written the right way? It, really, it's hard, uh, in, in my view, to rewrite this and make it acceptable. And, and this will go back to the second part of your first question. Uh, the, the problem with it, well, there, there are two main problems. Uh, one is a U.S. constitutional problem. Another is an Idaho law problem. The U.S. constitution problem is, of course, the bigger one. And that is the United States Constitution reserves certain powers to the federal government right, you know, in the Constitution itself. And I'm not talking about, you know, uh, activist judges, you know, on the court interpreting the Constitution in a, in a liberal way. I'm talking about the actual words that the framers wrote originally reserves uh, certain things to the federal government. And one of those things is what they call uh, setting up a rule of naturalization. And what that means in terms of this document is um, this document has to do with refugee resettlement. Refugee resettlement is part of immigration. Immigration is part of naturalization. So it's a subset of the power that's reserved to the federal government under the Constitution. And uh, many of your listeners may have heard of the Supremacy Clause, which is also part of the actual Constitution. 
uh, and that says that the, when the federal government legislates in an area that is reserved to the federal government, that law is supreme and cannot be undone uh, by the states or by local governments. And in fact, it's, it's uh, you know, through interpretation over the years, it's not just that it can't be undone. The local governments and state governments cannot even legislate in that arena. So if there's an area that's wholly set aside for federal legislation, then the state governments can't even propose and pass legislation in that arena. And that's the problem here. Uh, the proposed initiative proposes to legislate in an arena that's been uh, reserved for federal action. Uh, and, the, and then the state law question has to do with the, the really the enforcement part of this, of this uh, initiative, and that is uh, telling county commissioners that they can't challenge the law, that they can't overturn the ordinance, and in fact, imposing criminal penalties on them if they do. According to the proposed initiative, if a county commissioner attempts to undo this initiative with you know, county legislation through the normal course of events, uh, then they would lose their job, go to jail, and pay fines. Uh, so that can't be done because there's, I think it's probably universal in all governments in this country, a rule that one legislature cannot tell a future legislature what they can and can't do. Um, obviously, that would usurp your right and your ability to elect uh, representatives if, you know, if the 19... Uh, 99 legislature could say to the 2000 legislature, hey, you can't undo anything we've done. We're, we're protected here. You can't undo it. You might as well not even be elected. Uh, the rule is that any subsequent legislature can review legislative acts by a prior legislature. And the initiative process in this state puts the people as essentially a legislature. It, it allows them to propose and pass laws but those laws are subject to change and alteration by the succeeding legislative body. And uh, since this would be a county ordinance, the legislative body here is the county commissioners. So you can't tell next year's county commissioners that they can't undo this year's statutes. So those are the two big problems uh, with it from a legal point of view. And I don't take a, a position, you know, on the substantive issue necessarily. I mean, I think that there are good points on both sides here. Um, on the one on the one side, you have all these poor people uh, who are going through hell in these awful countries, and they're looking for refuge, uh, and they look to us and other countries for for that refuge, and you can't help but have sympathy for that. Uh, and on the other hand, you know that really bad people are going to take advantage of any you know uh, generosity that we show by trying to smuggle in bad people. Uh, so there are legitimate issues on both sides of that complex issue, um, but I'm not I'm not required or, or asking to be involved in that giant decision. The question is whether this is a legal way to attack it. Could they put together uh, something though that just as a referendum that would be a symbolic, uh, like a poll, just to get a head count? I mean, a reflection of the sure. population. Sure, and, and that that's done by um, legislatures, by you know the. Republican Party does that. The, the Twin Falls uh, commissioners do that. Pass a resolution, for instance. Uh, you could pass a resolution saying it is the stated position of Twin Falls County that you know either we don't want a refugee center or we want more refugee centers or if you put any refugees here, we want them uh, vetted for national security. You could pass a, a resolution that um, essentially states the opinion of the people of Twin Falls County. Uh, and, you know, states and, you know, localities do that all the time. A polling company could do the same thing, though, obviously, as well. Oh, sure. I mean, you could, you could, uh, you could have something informal like a poll that shows, you know, what we feel about that. And, and that, you know, um, there are polls all the time, not down to the county level, because, you know, there's no polling company that polls Twin Falls County, and obviously you'd have to pay to do that. But, you know, the national polls and their statewide polls, uh, they don't have any official effect. And really, a resolution doesn't either, but a resolution is an official statement of what our view is. And, and that, if this was just a resolution saying, we hereby resolve that we're against refugee centers being located in Twin Falls or having Sharia law or whatever, you can do that. 
I want to point out Grant Lobes is our guest in studio this hour of the program. He's the Twin Falls County Prosecutor. And you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Top story with Bill Colley on this Tuesday morning. Uh, if you have a question or comment for uh, for the prosecutor as well, you can give us a telephone call at 736-0300. We are going to talk a little bit of law enforcement too as well this morning. I'd like to point that out because uh, there is a running count now on the number of law enforcers who've been killed in this country uh, this year, and I think it's up to 25, which may not necessarily be setting any records, but a lot of these things have been happening with more frequency in recent weeks. And uh, we're going to mention a couple of things about that, too, as well, before we, uh, we, we conclude uh, uh, the program today. Um, before we, In fact, before we go to the break, we've got about two minutes before that. There was a story, uh, a was column in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that I read, and the writer is saying that what we're seeing now going on on the roads recently with uh, the treatment of law enforcement is really more of an overall breakdown of the whole notion of a respect for law in this country. Do you see that? Would you agree with that? Well, I see it the same way you do in reading um, and watching TV. Um, but I don't see it in Twin Falls. Uh, I, you know, It's possible, and, and I haven't spoken with a lot of the officers who are out on the road, whether they are starting to see it in, in smaller ways. Um, but we certainly don't see what we're seeing in Baltimore or Chicago or or any of these places where there's just open um, open disrespect to the rule of law. Uh, I, I think, uh, as in many things, um, some, some good trends, some bad trends, they come to Idaho last. And uh, sometimes we're, uh, we're behind the curve enough that we can outlast a bad trend, uh, and I'm hoping that's the case. But it's, uh, it's quite disturbing to see what's going on around the country. I, this was a this was actually a paragraph from a Washington Post story today on the uh, shooting of the trooper in Kentucky, and uh, this is the quote. His name was Ponder, by the way. This is the quote. Ponder discovered that Johnson Shanks' license was suspended, and learned that the two female passengers didn't have licenses. He then tried to find the group a hotel room so someone else could come and drive them. That's that's the quote from the story, and uh, so this was a law enforcer who was going out of his way to try and help these people, and he ends up dead uh, Sunday night after uh, after making those efforts. And I think that if you're looking for something that tells you about a lack of respect, mm-hmm. when when someone is actually looking out for you and you still end up killing them, uh, we've got a serious issue in some parts <laughs> of the country. 920, we've got a short break coming up. More with Grant Loeb. He's our Twin Falls County prosecutor. He's uh, in studio with us for most of the hour today. It's 54 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX at NewsRadio1310.com. Our studio guest is Grant Lobes. He's the uh, county prosecutor in Twin Falls County, Idaho. Joining us in studio, he does this on a monthly basis and also takes some of your telephone calls as well. Coming up on 923-54, Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story. Our telephone number is 736-0300. I was just starting to, uh, to share a story with him while we were off air. Uh, one of my former co-workers, a fellow by the name of Doug Beatty, uh, Doug was a, a housing police officer in Washington, D.C. for a time in the, the 1980s, and then later uh, was uh, running security at uh, Union Station in Washington, which he said was probably a little easier, although he used to find people living up in the rafters who some of them had made homes there in, in for many, many months, but they generally weren't the dangerous folks. And yet he has told me in the past that He's a little skeptical sometimes of police, but he he made a comment to me last night that if someone is throwing a brick at you and you're a police officer, you might want to uh, you might want to take action, and that might include actually shooting that person because that brick could be deadly. Now, you know this is the one thing I think uh, from the you know your background, you would probably understand this that the public doesn't necessarily understand that the police officer can protect himself, and it's not just, you know, he doesn't have to find a brick and throw it back. It's not about equal force. It's about getting you to stop, and sometimes that may require someone to use a service weapon. Right. And, you know, my my experience in Twin Falls is obviously colored by what happens here. Um, I see things in other parts of the state, and I see things around the country, and, and of course, an example which occurs where a policeman does something inappropriate is, is right, rightfully 
publicized. Uh, if a policeman shoots somebody who shouldn't be shot, if a policeman uses excessive force on somebody, that's going to be publicized and and rightly so. Uh, my experience in Twin Falls has been kind of the opposite in that I find policemen who probably certainly legally could defend themselves with deadly force and maybe sometimes should defend themselves with deadly force who are who take risks um, so as to not use deadly force and put themselves in danger, probably more danger than they should. I mean, I've had policemen who've been attacked by a person with a knife and haven't shot them uh, and certainly could because um, police know through their training that a person with a knife can kill you very quickly from a surprisingly great distance away before you can react and, and stop it. But my experience in Twin Falls has been that the police here are uh, go out of their way to not use deadly force to give the the person the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, maybe they're disturbed, maybe they're you know have a mental disorder, maybe they're just drunk or angry or something, and and it'll pass. But um, you know, I think that the more attacks there are on police, the more police are going to start to worry about the actual danger to themselves. And I think it just breeds, you know, bad behavior on both sides eventually. Um, so this is a really disturbing trend, this violence against police throughout the country. In the Wall Street Journal piece yesterday, uh, the writer talked to several law enforcers around the country. One was saying that he was trying to take someone, get someone out of a vehicle that had overturned. And so this is, you know, he, he's down on the ground and he's trying to get a door open that's been damaged. When someone showed up and stuck up a, a cell phone camera in his face and tried to goad him into a into a fight, uh, and, and there was a case not long ago, uh, a friends of mine from Delaware sent me video of this, where a man uh, on a street not far from the state capitol was shot, not killed. I mean, in fact, as it turned out, he he recovered quite quickly, but he was shot by police officers after he essentially decided to pull out a, a pistol himself. Uh, they weren't going to take any chances. But what happened following that was, as the police were trying to bring him to, a, you know, to a car, a mob showed up, and the mob was, I mean, engulfed the police department, screaming and yelling. And the thing is, you're worried that someone's going to actually try to grab somebody's, you know, service pistol in that situation. And I don't know how police can work in that environment. It, it used to be that they would try to clear people out of the way, but apparently there's so much concern now that they'll be. Uh, criticized for that, that they were definitely, six police officers surrounded by 100 people, definitely in some serious danger. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about what um, what police are required to do as part of their job, they, they are required to interact with people they've never met before and have no reason to suspect specifically of being violent. Um, for instance, like the, the situation where you're helping a person in an overturned car, you have no idea who that person is. You have no idea who a person is who might have run out of gas or might have a flat tire along the side of the road. And maybe it's just you or me or some law-abiding citizen who is in need of trouble uh, or in need of help because they're in trouble. And so the policeman stops to try to help that person. Well, if that person knows what the policeman doesn't know, that they're wanted for armed robbery for, you know, knocking over a liquor store two hours ago, they are all amped up and they're all ready to fight when the policeman's just thinking, here's a guy who has a flat tire. Uh, that's kind of what happened in Ferguson. I mean, uh, I don't know how much the officer knew, but Mr. Brown clearly knew he'd just robbed this you know, convenience store. Uh, so he was ready for a confrontation before the policeman was, I think. Uh, and so that's a problem. And then, of course, police uh, are involved in minor traffic incidents. I'm stopping somebody with an expired plate or with, you know, a turn signal is out. Again, you have no idea whether that person is going to say, thank you, officer, I didn't notice my turn signal was out, or has a gun on the seat next to him know knowing that they just committed a crime and that they're wanted. Um, and then, you know, it escalates from there. You know, police are obviously investigating the actual crime, looking for, for felons, uh, you know, engaged in a high-speed chase. All those... In those cases, the policeman always knows this is a situation that could get ugly fast. And they ought to know that about every other thing. But, you know, I think that their mentality is, um, I'm out here to help people in addition to catch bad guys. So they can get caught by surprise. We've got more with Grant Loves coming up on uh, Top Story.
along with Bill Colley on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 54 at 9 30. And of course, you can call us if you have a question or comment for the prosecutor, 736 0300. Write that down or commit it to memory. Wanted to mention, uh, if we could, uh, during this segment of the program, uh, before we continue with Grant Loeb's on the air, we may be into some cooler weather now, and it's probably going to be a while before we really see the really the hot, hot weather again. However, we still recommend that you give the folks at Tint Lady a call because window tints can actually help prevent the fading of your furniture, your drapes, your carpet. And you can also, as we say during the summertime, keep the home cool. We do want to point out they will do a free estimate. All you have to do is give them a telephone call, and they'll do this for your home or your office, even your automobile. The telephone number seven three six eight four six nine. You can find Tint Lady online at tintladyidaho.com. Now, locally owned and operated in excess of 20 years' experience, 1887 Highland Avenue East in Twin Falls, open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday by appointment only. And remember, don't squint, get Tint. Uh, having a conversation with a prosecutor off air, uh, we, we were talking about uh, cell phone cameras, and these things have become, I guess, uh, the word is, a uh, big word is ubiquitous. They're everywhere that people yeah. have them. Uh, and we were talking about the police officer who was at an accident scene and someone putting a cell phone camera right. in his and face. Trying to incite him to do and, something newsworthy. And people love mm-hmm. celebrity, even if it's uh, that old, yeah. quote, 15 minutes of it. They're looking for it, and this yeah. is what we're dealing with. Well, the cell phone um, gives everybody the opportunity to be the star of their own mini TV show. Because you know if you do something or catch something on video that is interesting, uh, that some news station is going to put it on the air, um, maybe even nationally. And so if you can you know, take a picture of yourself getting thumped by a policeman, you know you're going to get on TV. If you can get a policeman to thump you and you take a picture of it, you know, there you go. Uh, and that sounds like what the guy that you described was was trying to do. Um, and, you know, I think there's a little bit more of an exhibitionist streak in people that's been brought out by these cell phones. You know, you see people posting these selfies all over. I mean, our, our president takes selfies of himself. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't even know what a selfie was till my, my daughter told me, and I thought, well, why would you want to do that? I mean, the least interesting thing about any uh, picture I take is if I'm in it. Uh, but that seems to not be the case with a lot of people. And I think um, the cell phone video, um, you know, you're you're directing and starring in your own TV show. And um, police have these things put in their face all the time. And so do other public figures. I mean, um, you know, we've, we've all seen these things where some, you know, candidate or some public officials making a speech and He's asked a question, and you know it's on you know a little shaky video later that night on TV. Um, so I think that uh, I think that's part of what's going on with some of these things. I think some of these people wouldn't do what they're doing if they didn't know they were on TV. Well, and we get back to that story we talked about this a couple of months ago <clears throat> in South Carolina, where a police officer shot uh, right. on video. You see a police officer shooting and and bringing down a suspect who appears to be running away. The video, though itself, the quality was shaky. It was terrible. The thing is, we don't, in a lot of these videos, you don't know what happened in the 20 seconds or 20 minutes before that video started. Right. And so if a police officer is seen decking someone, if that person had just been spitting on the police officer or taking a swipe at him, but that's not on camera, uh, we don't obviously get that impression. Well, like any evidence that's collected, um, you know, you have to consider everything in context. And sometimes the context is obvious and sometimes it's not. Um you know, that video, um, which, you know, and there are some videos that you say, well, thank goodness we had that or we wouldn't know what had happened. And that might fall in that category. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that South Carolina shooting, um, for somebody who just watched the video and watched some news stories about what had happened, that doesn't look like a very good, very good shoot to me. Um, but sometimes you don't really know what is going on and then suddenly you just have a little snippet of it that's, that's caught on video. Um, and this is, you know, the, the, one of the problems I see with this move in the country towards these body cams worn by policemen. Uh, the policeman's body cam isn't going to get everything either. And I think people have a, a, an elevated expectation that if a policeman's got a camera on his body somewhere, uh, whether it's on his head or on his chest, that they're going to 
kind of see everything he saw and they're going to understand everything he did and they're going to be able to dissect it and, and, and criticize it. Uh, the problem is that uh, there's no guarantee that at any given time a camera that's on your head or on your chest is getting the relevant view. And so uh, it, it isn't going to be the panacea that people are thinking where, hey, we don't even really need a policeman to testify. We just need to watch this video. You know, we, we're, we're not going to get to that stage. I mean, you, your video is only good as the person taking it and as good as the view that that person had. So, as I said, there are many problems with the body camera movement, but um, it isn't going to solve the problems everybody thinks it's going to solve. In fact, well, I've got a question. Well, we've got one more segment I had. I've got a question for the prosecutor about uh, the evidence, uh, how you can, uh, you can actually, can you use uh, cell phone video as evidence, or perhaps even uh, uh, could you have uh, evidence that comes in or proposed as evidence from a body cam that may actually not be admissible in court. That's on the way in just a couple of minutes. It's 20 minutes now from 10 o'clock. Grant Loeb's joining us in studio this morning. Bill Colley as well with you on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. This is Top Story. Our studio guest is Grant Loeb's. Of course, he's the uh, the top prosecutor in Twin Falls County. Joins us on, uh, well, it's, a, it's is it the third Tuesday? Is that what we call it? The third yes. Tuesday of every month? Yep. And since we had a Tuesday on the first, it kind of came along in the middle of the month today. Uh, joining us today, we've been talking about a couple of different issues. Uh, if you've got just a question or comment for him, we've only we're down to maybe about four or five minutes. Seven three six zero three hundred. A question that I that I, I got thinking of when you were talking about body cameras for police officers, but also people in the public who are taking pictures with a, a cell phone camera, uh, videos and the like when they see something. A lot of that stuff would never make it into a courtroom as evidence, would it? Well, it depends. I mean, a, a lot of it probably would. Uh, the The standard for evidence is uh, photographic and video evidence is does it accurately portray the incident which it, you know, purports to show. And if you have a person who can say of a video or of a photograph, yes, that's the way it looked at the time. That's the way it was when I saw it. Then it usually comes into evidence. It doesn't um, require that you even be the person who took the photograph. But if if I if somebody brings a photograph of somebody you know committing a crime or you know something that shows identity, for instance, you know from a you know a convenience store video or something, and I can show that to somebody who says, "Yep, that's the way the guy looked when I saw him. That's what happened as I remember it." They can authenticate the photograph or the video by testifying that it is an accurate portrayal. Um, so it usually comes in. The, the question with, with these videos, uh, like body cam videos, um, and, and sometimes videos that people take, is you know, how much do you show to accurately portray the, the context? And if, if I have a video and I want to show two seconds of it, but I don't want to show the other five minutes that are on either side of it, um, I'll probably be required to show the whole thing um, you know, in order to get completeness. Um, and so because you know, we know if we take one snapshot of it that that can be deceptive. Um, and that's part of the problem, again, with, with the body cams is where, where do you start and where do you stop? Um, because... You know, some agencies have uh, proposed rules that, well, the policeman just turns it on when he's in a situation he thinks needs to be recorded. Well, that, by its nature, makes it kind of a selective evidence gathering tool. Uh, and then there are some places where they insist, no, you got to keep it on all the time. You got to turn it on at the beginning of your shift and turn it off at the end. And obviously, at that point, you're gathering an enormous amount of data that needs to be stored collated, analyzed, watched, redacted, and turned over to defense attorneys if there's a crime. And, you, you, you know, that would be the thing. You might have to sit through court and watch every police officer in, in Twin Falls going through the drive through at McDonald's because well, we, of that. Well, it probably wouldn't be something you'd have to show in court, but somebody at the police station is going to have to watch every minute of it. Then they're going to give it to me, and I'm going to have to watch every minute of it. Then I'm going to have to give it to the defense attorney, and he's going to have to watch every minute of it. Um, because you don't know whether there's something important that happens at minute 36, um, even though the crime actually happened, you know, an hour later. So it's it's going to be an enormous, enormous suck of manpower and time and storage capacity. Um, and, uh, well, I'm anxious or, or terrified. I don't know which is the right word to see how it works. 
but in our local community. And when it happened in Meridian, I thought, well, okay, it'll be six or eight months before some other cities consider this because they'll want to see what the experience is. But it wasn't long after that that in Twin Falls it was adopted as well. So it seems to be people are just, they're going ahead with it. And I don't know, have they considered all of those questions? I think they're starting to consider them. Um, we haven't had any uh, agency that I'm aware of that has uh, really answered all these questions, even some of the ones that are going forward with it. Uh, Twin Falls um, is has you know, given a notice that they're going to go forward with it, but they haven't yet implemented it, I think, in part because they're trying to answer these questions and, and you know, start with a, a finished product rather than, you know, make changes every two months or two days after they implement it. But um, some of these some of these problems, I think, are, are very difficult to answer. You know, when do you turn it off? When do you turn it on? If I knock at your house and you're you're a rape victim and you're traumatized and you're bleeding, you know, and your head's bashed and your children are running around. Do I photograph you or do I not? And if I turn it off, what's the defense going to say about my, what happened during the black time? Um, you know, do I uh, do I turn it on at the beginning of my shift and record going through the drive through at McDonald's? Well, probably you shouldn't, but if you don't, when did you turn it back on? Um, and then, you know, how long do you keep the video. Um, it's evidence. It's gathered by the state of Idaho. It's pretty hard to argue that you ever can get rid of it. Uh, so, you know, there are proposals to get rid of it after 200 days or after so many months, but then some policeman or prosecutor is making a decision to destroy that evidence. And what if that's evidence that a defendant needs later on and we've gathered it and then destroyed it? It's a big problem. Got about a minute left. Have you been consulted by any of these governments? Uh, locally, sure. Locally, our our you know our police department is good at consulting the people who are who are players in the system to to get their input. Uh, so yeah, they've 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 come in. I've spoken with the police department about it, and I've told them some of the problems I see, and I think they're trying to wrestle with the you know with the issue. And and again, I think the council will take into consideration police department, your office, and, and all of these other inputs that they're getting? They should. I mean, the, the, the police uh, who've come and talked to me about it are certainly uh, listening and, and uh, understand the issue. Um, whether that means that they'll solve the issue before they, they uh, implement the system, I don't know. Uh, some of these are going to be really difficult to solve. I want to thank Grant Loves for coming by today and joining us in the studio. Thank you. Offering some thoughts on, uh, especially some you know, law enforcement thoughts today. Uh, we do want to point out Mike Gallagher coming up next, brought to you exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736-6563.